Okay. Well, good evening. I am Lauren Gates, your host of this week's Airway Health Solutions Conversation featuring our very own Kevin Ohlendorf. Tonight's topic is tips and tricks with expansion appliances. So for those of you who do not know Kevin, Kevin is a president and third generation owner of the Ohlendorf Appliance Laboratory. The lab is located in St. Louis, Missouri and services doctors in all 50 states. Kevin has worked full-time at the lab for almost 30 years he has attended thousands of hours of CE courses on a variety of topics, including cephalometrics, orthodontics, growth and development, minor tooth movement, airway and sleep disorders. He has also lectured to hundreds of doctors on those topics as well. So we consider him an expert in all areas of appliance therapy and orthodontics. So welcome, Kevin. It's nice welcome. to have you back. I appreciate it. Thanks for having me. You were actually the first guest to kind of kick <laughs> off this whole conversation series. And um, wow, what, a, what an amazing seven months it's been as far as airway appliance goes and expansion appliance goes. I mean, if, if you think about it in seven months, how many appliances do you think that we have uh, done together, you know, with the expansion of our clients and, and just bringing this to life? Oh, yeah, it's been well over a thousand, I'm sure. Wow. You know, that's a good thing to to check on. You're always getting me with the numbers, and I I'm need sorry. To it down. <laughs> <laughs> I'm I actually just thought of, of it. Stuff. I didn't even like prepare for that. I was just saying, <laughs> oh my gosh, think of the the ripple effects of all yeah. this, because you know what I like to think about are those thousands of patients that are being helped, yeah. and you know I'm one of them. I'm I'm like a client too. You know, like that hair club right. for men. You know, I'm I'm also a client. <laughs> exactly. So, um, well, tonight I. Well, I figured let's have you on because you are our go-to resource. I mean, I must email you a good, you know, two or three times a day sometimes <laughs> on just questions that we get from our Airway Health Solutions clients on the expansion appliances themselves. And you have such a, a wealth of information that I thought, why not share it with our clients and, and just the general public um, as well so you can help them with the tips and tricks you've learned along your 30-year career. So I'm going to go ahead and invite you to go ahead and share your screen. Okay. And um, we also have another 250 doctors registered tonight with about 200 questions. So again, this topic is, is alive and kicking for sure. So we're going to do our best to answer the questions that are really related specifically to the techniques of the appliances. Right. Okay. Very Thanks. good. Let's get started here. If I can... All right, did I do that correctly? Yep, you're good. All right, great. Well, thanks for having me again. Um, my name is Kevin Ollendorf. I'm the president of the Ollendorf Appliance Laboratory, and we're located in St. Louis, Missouri. And Lauren and I have been doing this for a while. And um, it's interesting, we get a lot of the same questions that come up time and time again at the lab, especially with doctors that are just starting out. And so, there's some that just about everybody has at the beginning and little pearls and things that we can offer to help uh, make this easier for you. So I put together about my top 10 or 12 different tips and tricks for all the different types of fixed and removable expansion appliances and how to deal with the lab and that kind of thing, just to kind of hit the highlights of them here and hopefully answer some questions for everybody and uh, clear up anything or any issues that you might be having with your cases or with your appliance management with them. Um, and when you get started and you start this journey of using appliance therapy, one of the big questions is what to always send in. So we can take models, we can take PBS impressions, and we can take all your types of digital scans. We accept scans from all the, the every single one of the different companies. So we can take them from everybody. Um, do we send in bites? Do we not send in bites? Should I send an upper model, lower model, or both? How does that all work? Uh, how do I articulate what I want the appliance to do or what my objectives are? How do I make sure that what I want is what I get? And how to, according to the way I've been taught, and some of the different, you know, different things that you might have questions about to make sure that you get exactly what you want. We're going to go through all these things here real quick um, to kind of show you what we need and, and how to make it an easy starting point and transition to be able to get these appliances started out in the right way. So like I said, we get we accept the scans from all the major systems. 
Right now, we're probably getting about 50% of our scans from iTero um, scanners, and the, all the other ones combined represent about the other 50%. So if you want to send us scans and you have questions about it, how to get us on your system, just give the lab a call and we'll get you set up so that we can be a preferred lab for you and you can um, be able to send us their scans right away real simply. Um, the first big tip with scans is it's something that happens all the time and the uh, my staff is constantly making these calls, unfortunately, but you always want to scan as much of the palate and as far distally as you possibly can when you send in for any type of appliance. That upper scan is really important. So we get a lot of cases where doctors will just submit that horseshoe scan because they're used to either doing just that for their crown and bridge or they're using that for their um, submittal to a line or other aligner companies and they don't realize that they need the whole palette. So this is what we end up getting a lot of times and there's no palette here. With all of these appliance uh, appliances, we need a palette in order to either pour acrylic into or to be able to set the screws for the fixed expanders at the right height so that uh, it's not inhibiting the tongue and then we get the screws deep enough where they need to be. So if you send us a scan that looks like this, we're gonna to have to give you a call and ask for a new scan. This is what we're looking for. And I've talked to all the scanning companies and they all tell me, if you can see it, they can scan it. So don't be afraid to go back and get as far back into the palette as you possibly can. This one's exceptional. I mean, this is way back. If all the bars look like this that we get, we'd be thrilled. Uh, but you want to definitely try to get as far back as you possibly can uh, with that palette so that we can get the appliance uh, made correctly to fit the best for you. And if you don't, we're going to have to call you and then it delays. You got to get the patient back, delays, all kinds of stuff. So real important tip number one, get that full palette if possible. And Kevin, if I may interrupt, just for the actual scan itself, I think it's yeah. best to start with the incisive papilla and stitch it from there the actual scanning to do that, Correct. that's a tip. So you really wanna uh, capture that incisive papilla and then that's how you capture the palate from there. Absolutely, yep, that's great. Tip number two, um, should I, when we get this question a lot, should I send upper or lower? Even if I'm just getting an appliance on the upper or just the lower, do you need both? And yes, we always recommend you send both the upper and lower, either models or scans or impressions, even if you're only getting it on one arch. It just helps us when we go to make the appliance to make sure that everything fits as well as it can and that there's no interferences. Sometimes you can't avoid having an interference, but if we've got the opposing model, it can help us to try to limit it or change the design slightly to make sure that um, there it's going to be made as comfortable and best fitting for the appliance or for the patient. So you always want to send upper and lower, even if you're only going to get one arch um, appliance at the time. Another really good tip is um, if, you're, if you've been taught by Dr. Moralia and you've taken the courses and you want his designs, make sure that you write on the prescription sheet or in the notes that you want an airway health appliance using Dr. Moralia's design. And this is really important to make sure that we get it made the way that he recommends in the courses, because there's some very specific things and reasons he designs appliances specific ways that you learn about. And we wanna make sure you do it, we make it that way so you get the results that you're supposed to. We make hundreds of different types of appliances with all different types of you know, little designs and tweaks here and there. And so if you wanna get exactly what you've learned at the courses, then you need to write that on there. And that we, we can, uh, you'll correspond with what he's teaching. Okay. So let's jump into some of the appliances. Uh, we'll start with the upper fixed expansion appliance. And one of the big things is always, how do we turn the screw? And it's really important that the screws turn correctly so that the um, patient is getting the activation done in a timely manner and everything's going and flowing correctly. So to turn this screw, it's a very unique screw and it's only for this one specific type of appliance. But you have the patient open as wide as they possibly can. You insert the wrench at the upper anteriors and swing the wrench down to the lower anteriors and remove the wrench at the lower anteriors. And that is one complete 
turn of the appliance. And Dr. Morali goes into the all the different, um, how often you should turn it and that kind of thing in his courses. So it, it really is helpful to take the courses to get that detailed information about exactly why he turns them at a specific rate for the different patients and, and what's needed and, and that type of thing. The screw is, again, is very unique. As you expand it out, you'll be able to start to see little um, indents in the housing of the screw that'll let you know how much it's expanded. And so every one of these little lines is gonna show that you've expanded it out about two millimeters. All the screws we're gonna talk about, and I'm gonna mention this a bunch because it, it happens more frequently than it should, but you always need to be measuring these screws to see how much they've opened because they will come apart. If you continue to expand them and turn the screw over and over, the appliance is gonna come apart into two pieces and it, it gets to be a mess. So you really, as you, every time you see the patient, you wanna be measuring the screw to see how much expansion you've already done and how much more you have. Another um, nice part of this screw is there's a little locking nut that'll allow you to lock the appliance and the screw in its position so that it kind of acts as a, a retainer as you kind of wait for the lower to catch up or you let everything kind of stabilize. So let's look at the screw opened up. This is the super screw. And you can see over here on this side, there's little lines that are grooved into the housing of the screw. And the distance between those lines is two millimeters. So you can tell from this screw that it's been opened eight millimeters because you can see four lines. There's a line there, one, two, three, four, means you've got eight millimeters that it's been opened up. So that tells you you only have a few more millimeters to go until that screw will start to come apart. And so you're almost finished with it when you get out to this stage. Another good part of this picture are these anterior sw uh, sweep arms. And you're gonna wanna be a adjusting these arms every time you see the patient, because if you don't, they end up gonna be coming back and poking the tongue. So you, this is, they've never been adjusted here, so they're pretty dramatic. But when you see the patient each time, you can go in and just take a three prong and make little bends in them to get those wires to be flush up against the lingual of the anterior teeth. And that can be done in the mouth. It, it doesn't have to be exact. You don't have to you know, make sure they're in a specific certain position. You just wanna get them out of the way of the tongue and up against the lingual of the anterior teeth a little bit. So that's your main objective with them. You don't really have, they don't have to be perfect by any means. And you just go in and grab them anywhere you can along the wire and with the uh, three prong in order to get those to straighten up and start to line up and push on the anteriors a little bit. So as we this screw opens up, you can see the threads on the other portion of the screw, and this is the locking nut. Once you've got it where you want it, you can turn this locking nut with the same wrench that you use for the main part of the screw and just turn it until it goes all the way up against the housing of the screw and that'll lock it in place. Um, some doctors wait till the very end and then they do that and lock it in place. Others will advance it as they go. So if you know they come in every week and this is opened up a little bit and there's a little gap between the locking nut and the housing, you can go ahead and have the, go ahead and advance that locking nut all the way up against the housing and it'll prevent that screw from bracketing up and really hold it in place. Uh, what's nice about it is it's the same wrench that you use for the turning or activationing of it. And it's just really just a stop is all it is to prevent the uh, main part of the screw from backing up against the thread. So you can be adjusting that and moving it forward really as you go along or wait till the very end, however you wanna do it to help hold everything in position. So one big tip with this, uh, with these fixed expanders is we normally only always we'll put bands on the first molars or the E's, and we'll talk about that a little bit later, but it is helpful to add a little bit of composite on the lingual of the D's or the first deciduous molars. And what that does is it just helps hold the appliance in place. It creates another retention point and it prevents that appliance from riding up the lingual of the teeth as it's activated. So if you've got this appliance in place, you wanna put just a little bit of composite, not on top of the wire, 
but just between the wire and the occlusal edge of the D's or the first deciduous molars right here. And all it's doing is just creating a little shelf so that this appliance can't ride down or, or start to slide down the teeth. Um, and you don't want to put it over the top of the wire because you want that appliance to be free floating or free moving as it's expanded. So you don't want the composite to inhibit the movement in any way. And just adding a little bit of composite in this area will make a big difference. If you're having issues with it coming out or if the patient's pulling on it or anything like that, adding this composite right here gives it another retention point to just make it that more difficult for them to get it out or you know they're playing with it with their tongue or anything like that. It'll just stabilize it that much more. We in the past have sometimes tried to put a band on this tooth and on the first molar, but it really creates a difficult time to try to seed it. Trying to seed a four banded appliance is really difficult to do. The path of insertion has got to be just right on the money. And also trying to fit good bands on these deciduous teeth. There are always little different shapes and odd shapes and things is hard too. So what we found is just putting this little composite ledge and don't be afraid to bulk it up, you know, make it pretty decent size if you need to. That'll really make a big difference to help hold that appliance in place better, um, especially if they're pulling on it or it seems to be coming out um, in any way. Another tip that we see, and I, a couple of people had asked these questions, Lauren, I'd seen that um, you know, from the ones that you sent me this morning, is what do I do if the molars haven't really erupted that? So we're talking about starting kids that are six, seven, maybe eight years old, and those first molars are through, but they may be only halfway erupted. And it's difficult to get a band on it because at the lab, when we try to fit that band, we have to estimate the size of that tooth. And a lot of times, that the, the widest portion of that tooth is either at the gum line or even under the gum line. So it makes it really hard to fit a band for that. And then for you to be able to seat the band at the same time. So what we recommend for both the upper or the lower arch is to band the ease. So if the first molars haven't erupted enough to band, most of the time there's good root structure left on those ease and plenty on there to support the appliance. Um, and so what we'll do is band the ease and then run an extension wire back to engage the first molars. And this can be done for the upper or the lower appliance. Um, I just happen to have a picture of a lower here, um, and, but it, it works great for it. So this little extension wire right here will pick up the first molar and expand it as, as well, you know, throughout the whole arch. You know, you're not just going to expand the front and then the first molars will be lagging behind this extension wire will make a big difference and allow the whole arch to be expanded. And it, those, the ease are usually erupted plenty for us to be able to fit bands on. So this is a really good technique if um, those first molars haven't erupted. Okay. Especially on the lower arch, because a lot of times the patient will have a tissue tag over the distal of this tooth and trying to see the band can be really difficult. You know, I know some doctors go in and actually laser that off, but you know, it, it gets that now you're getting really involved with something that should be pretty simple and straightforward. So um, we'll routinely always put them on the first molars unless you request them on the ease or unless we see a molar that's just buried and we know we don't have any chance, then we'll probably call you and say, hey, is it okay if we move these up to the ease? Um, and add that extension wire for you. So we're trying to look out for you as best we can with them to make sure that they're fitting as well as possible. But that's a little, a good tip um, for these appliances. If you're having some that are coming out and not staying in like they should, you might want to consider um, switching over to have the ease banded instead of the first molars. So on the lower expanders, uh, one tip that's good is just like on the uppers, we put a little composite on the lingual of the Ds. Well, on the lower, what you're going to want to do is put some composite on the lingual of the two most lingual teeth. So it may be both laterals, maybe both centrals, one lateral, one central, whatever the, the most lingual, but you want to put two, two different composite ledges on there. And that'll help, again, hold the appliance in place, provide more retention, and help the springs work to align the anteriors a little better. So in this picture, you can see this lateral and this lateral, they're close, but they're the most lingual teeth. 
So we want to just put, oops, sorry. There we go. Uh, want to put a little composite ledge on the lingual of those two teeth. And again, not over the top of the wire, but you're just creating a little shelf so that that wire is free floating and can move back and forth as the screws expanded. But what that'll do is it'll hold those wires down where they're supposed to be, which is right at the um, gingival margin. And it'll allow the appliance to stay in better. They won't be able to get at it with their tongue um, and dislodge it. And it'll work really nicely to help hold it in place and create that additional retention point. So those things are really helpful um, for these appliances to make sure that they when you see them, they stay in all the way until you're ready to remove them. We talked about the upper, how to measure the uh, screw to see how much you've expanded it. You can also measure the lower fixed expanders as well. And you're just gonna measure the distance uh, from the, that the two housings of the screw have moved apart as the screw's been turned. And again, I'm gonna keep mentioning this because it's one of the hardest things to deal with when it happens but these screws will come apart if they're overexpanded. So be careful with them as you go. So you can see this, uh, this is a model of a screw that's been uh, with it in place. I, it always amazes me how doctors or assistants are able to take these impressions to look so good with these mm -hmm. appliances in there. Some of the ones we get at the lab without appliances aren't half as good as this, mm -hmm. but this uh, doctor did a great job with it and their staff did an awesome job with this. But you can see the housings for the screw. As this is opened up, you'll see the threads right here and the two housings move away from each other. And you wanna just measure that distance from one housing to the other. And that'll tell you how much the screw has been activated. These lower fixed expanders are eight millimeter screws and each turn is a quarter millimeter. So you wanna watch it. You don't wanna get much more than about 28 30 turns at the very, very most, which is gonna be about your seven millimeters of distance between the two housings. If you get out beyond that, you run the risk of the screws coming apart. The appliance also gets a little bit unstable because there's no threads in there holding it together. And so you wanna just be really careful the closer you get out to that five and a half, six, six and a half area that you don't go too far with it. So it's really important to be seeing these patients a lot. If you can't see them and they have to miss an appointment, it's better to tell them to stop turning and wait until they come back to start turning again until you can see them. Uh, the appliance won't back up. It'll stay and act as a space maintainer and just you know, sit there and wait until something happens, but you run the risk of um, having them the screw coming apart if they keep turning them and you can't see them. So if that does happen, they cancel an appointment on you, it's really good advice to tell them to stop turning the screw until you can see them again and check them. Okay. Uh, some other tips for the fixed appliances, you know, they're pretty straightforward. They go in and they turn the screw and they go, but keeping them in can sometimes be an issue and they really need to be seated in the right position so that the forces of the screws will uh, direct and give you the development that you need. So here's some tips for seating your appliances. I recommend using separators before a couple days before you're gonna seat the appliances just to make sure you have plenty of space. You wanna try that appliance in before cementing it just with the bands, just to make sure that everything's fitting okay before you go and cement it. And then you wanna make sure the bands are seated down far enough. So you have about one to two millimeters of crown exposure evenly above the band. That means they're down where they need to be. So here's a picture of um, some molars that are being separated. Um, this is, of course, an adult. If you're doing a, um, in the mixed dentition and they have their second deciduous molars or ease in place, I know some doctors come in and they, they won't use separators, but they'll use some lightning strips and actually just uh, slenderize or IPR the distal of those ease to get the space and that way they avoid having to have to put the separators on there and it doesn't do any damage or you know, much of an issue to those E's. So that's, that can be a real quick way to get those in better, but separators are really helpful. They make a big difference in being able to seat these appliances correctly. When you seat the band, um, you wanna make sure you're seeing an even amount of crown all the way around the band on the buckle, the lingual, 
on the distal and mesial. If you've got the dis or the lingual overseeded and it's much lower than the buckle, it's going to affect how the appliance fits and the ability for it to stay in. So you want to make sure you've got that band and see about the same amount of crown height all the way around. This is one issue that, that comes up. Some doctors may not be able to get that band down all the way, and they run the risk of trying to bend the band material over the occlusion. I've heard some doctors try to do and that kind of thing. You definitely want to avoid that. You got to make sure that you get this band down all the way. If you get it this far and it's not going down anymore, um, either the band's too small or something, you don't have enough space or separation in there to seat it properly. And you really need to, to do that. You don't want to leave the appliance like this. It's going to come out within a very short period of time. So get those bands down, seat it as far as you possibly can to make sure that the appliance stays in like it should. There's some real basic supplies that you Kevin, can- May I just interrupt you with yeah. a couple of questions on sure. um, the bands? So yeah. um, Dr. Rocca has asked, she said, recently many have been discussing 3D printed bands on expanders, so you don't need spacers. Um, are you doing this? We are in the process of that. Okay. So that really is where the future of orthodontics is headed, is to 3D, is to start printing metal. So right now, you know, we're printing models and we're printing, we're going to introduce um, digital splints that we're printing night guards and splints uh, here real soon. But printing metal is the next phase. And it, I should hopefully, I'm working on it. Let's just say okay. that. Okay. <laughs> It'll oh, be there. Just, okay. just working on it, right? And here. then just some more questions directly on the, um, on the, on the, on the bands. Others have recommended doing lower first instead of upper, so you know how much to expand on upper. What are your thoughts on that? This, it's, that is a, a highly debated topic in orthodontics mm -hmm. over the years. Okay. And it's kind of more of a technique question. I know Dr. Morali has very specific reasons and um, justifications for why he does it the way he does. And he will almost always do the upper arch first. Okay. It, it's, no. There's a saying in ortho that I, that I believe in a lot is that the maxilla is the criminal and the mandible is the victim. Mm -hmm. So if you have a, a maxilla that's too constricted, it's gonna cause the mandible to be too constricted. So if you can get the upper arch corrected where it should be, your lower arch is gonna follow along. Now there's, that's, there's a, there are other philosophies that say, yes, do the lower arch first and then fit the upper to the lower. But for tongue room and tongue function, I think you're better off getting that upper arch as wide and as best as you possibly can and then getting the lower to fit. But that that's my opinion. I know Dr. Moralia has some very good thoughts and um, reasoning why he likes to treat the way he does and talks about those in the courses as well. Okay. Really goes through them in great detail. Terrific. So uh, this basic amount of supplies are really about all you need for, um, for seating the fixed appliances. And I'd recommend getting them. We, we offer them, you know, we don't sell a lot of supplies, but if you need these types of things, let me know and we can get them for you. But this is a band pusher, I'm sorry, this is a band biter. And so this little edge right here goes on the part of the band and then the patient bites on this stick and it helps to seat the band. Um, so it can be a nice, useful tool to help get those bands down where they need to be. These are some separators. This is a special separating plier to help get the separators in. Uh, cement, band cement. This is a posterior band remover. And this is a little band pusher. So on this edge, you can actually put it up on the side of the band and help push it yourself, as opposed to have the patient biting it into place. So um, these are some different you know, things you would want to have little tools to help get those bands to seat and be um, in the proper position for you as you go. Okay. So let's move on to the removable appliances. There's not as much to them as a fix, but we'll kind of, we'll go through these here. You know, the basic upper two screw expander um, that Dr. Moralia teaches. The, one of the big things, and uh, when you start out with this is the acrylic. The acrylic is really a, the most important part of these appliances to get them to do what you want them to do 
and to get the real benefits out of these appliances, managing this acrylic is really important. So one of the things that you can do is go in and as the appliance expands, trim the anterior acrylic a little bit and it'll help, you can actually use it to help guide the teeth and it'll also help the appliance to fit in better. So this is a great example of one where you've got some anterior crowding and misaligned teeth. And so when we make the appliance, we're gonna pour that acrylic right up against the lingual of the anterior teeth in all these different areas so that it touches those teeth. And as it's expanded, the acrylic will push on those teeth and straighten them out and move them. The only issue is that as these screws open, this part of the acrylic right here is no longer gonna to be touching this part of the tooth. It's now gonna to start to be coming over into this area where it can possibly get in the way or may not be as beneficial as it is when it's in that spot. So here's an example of it. Originally, this acrylic was over here. Now you've expanded it and it's here. It may be hitting the teeth in a different area and causing the appliance to ride up the lingual of the mm -hmm. teeth a little bit. So you can come in here the, and grind away this acrylic so that it's not hitting in spots you don't want it to, or if it's moving teeth in a way that you don't want them to be moved. Um, so these are starting to ride up. This acrylic's riding up the lingual of these teeth a little bit, and you can come in and grind it away. Some doctors will grind it into an ideal or perfect arch form so that the acrylic will touch the teeth if they're rotated in the most distal part of the rotation, and it'll actually start to spin that back and straighten those teeth up as you go along. So you definitely wanna come in and smooth these edges out because they can be rough on the patient's tongue. You can cut it back a little bit. It'll also you know, reduce a little bit of the bulk on those two. So it'll make it a little bit easier for them to speak with it in and just kind of round these edges off as you go. And the appliance will fit and seat better in there a little bit. If you're finding that, you know, when they put it in at the very beginning and it fit great, but over time, it's not starting to fit as well. It may be because you've got acrylic hitting in spots that um, are causing or preventing it from being able to seat all the way into where it needs to be. So if you go in and just grind away that acrylic, it can make a big difference on how it fits and then also how you move some of the teeth. Another big tip, and Dr. Moralia talks about this a bunch in the courses, and it's one of the big um, attributes of using this appliance, and he teaches you how to use it to get some really good results with it. But you want to be going in and trimming the palatal acrylic to allow the palate to drop and to open up the airway. And also, you do it to help the appliance fit better as well, for the same reason that you trim the anterior acrylic. But you can see, if you think about it, when we go in and we put this appliance, the screws in the appliance and then pour the acrylic, it's at the vault of the palate. As it expands out, these edges are gonna hit the, the palate in different spots. So if you come in with a burr and start removing this acrylic, it'll create a little void between the appliance and the palate to allow the appliance to, or the uh, palate to start to drop a little bit. And then that helps to open up your airway and it'll also help the appliance to fit in there better as well, because you'll be able to seat it all the way in just the same way that you may have that issue in the anterior region where it doesn't fit all the way in as well. Also, you wanna come in and hit these edges with the burr as well. That'll kind of just round them out a little bit. They can get a little sharp from the burr that we use to cut the screw down the middle to begin with. And sometimes that can irritate the patient's tongue or the, the tissue. So if you take a little burr and just round over the top of that edge, that can make it a little bit more comfortable for the patient as they wear it as well. But Dr. Moralia talks a lot about this in the course about the importance of how this acrylic hits the palate and how to manage it in order to get some really good results with the adult patients using these removable appliances. Another good tip, like just like we talked about with the uh, fixed expanders, you got to measure the removable expanders as well. And you're, this way, what you're going to be doing is just measuring the distance between the two different cuts of the acrylic to see how much uh, you know, you've gotten, how much it's expanded and how much more you can activate it. And again, these are gonna come apart if they're overactivated. I hate to sound like a broken record, but it, it's really important. So as they expand, the two pieces of acrylic move away from each other as the screws open up. 
and you just take a caliper or a, a perio probe and just measure this distance from one side of the cut of the acrylic to the other. And that'll tell you that distance will tell you how much you've expanded it out and how much more you have to go. You can see in this picture here how the uh, threads for the screw are coming out of the housing. And again, as that, the more it opens up, the more that starts to become unstable because it's not as much uh, thread or screw being held together to hold that together. So you want to be really cautious when you get out to those levels that you um, that you have an, that you're not over expanding it and over uh, activating it. Kevin, on this slide, is there a reason why why one side covers the teeth and the other doesn't? Sometimes doctors will remove it, <laughs> and it's just a way to kind of show it. I didn't talk too much about it, but well, you may start with occlusal coverage and. Um, because you've got a posterior crossbite you're trying to jump and you want to really get that width. But as you get towards the end of it, things are doing well and you want to make it a little bit more comfortable for the patient. You can go ahead and just take a burr and knock all that acrylic off of there. It'll reduce the amount of bulk on the, the appliance and just make it a little bit easier for them to wear, um, especially if they're going to be wearing it. Let's say you're not going to go directly into either brackets or aligners after you've done the expansion. They're going to wear it as a retainer for a couple months. The more bulk you can remove off of there, the easier it is for them to wear. So it's just a way of showing that. And that we just did one side, and then the doctor would come over and do the other side, you know, after this was done. But yeah, you can take those on and off. Yep. How many millimeters of expansion are we seeing right now? Uh, I can't tell from this exactly, but I bet. This screw is about done. So you're probably okay. about six, about six millimeters of expansion in there. You may be able to get another millimeter, but I wouldn't go much more than that. It's right. pretty much maxed out. And okay. this is the same patient as before. So you can really see the dramatic difference in the anteriors, how they straighten up, even without adjusting the acrylic, uh, just in a few months, it can make a big difference with it. Uh, I'm envious of this case. I can't wait to get there. <laughs> <Right. Me too. laughs> I thought I was looking good. Now it right. looks so good. <laughs> Slow and steady. Right. <laughs> when you get the appliances back, and one of the big important parts with removables is compliance. They work great when they're being worn. If people don't wear them, they're not going to work at all. And one thing that's important is that they fit tightly. If they're flopping around and they're not staying tight and you know it's difficult for the patient to wear them, it's gonna be, you're, you're battling their compliance and their, um, uh, you know, their ability to wanna wear it. So it's important to go in and tighten up the Adams clasp, tighten up the ball clasp as you need it. All you need to do with them is just use a bird breek or a flat on round instrument to just make some little adjustments to tighten them up. Little goes a long way with them. And I'd really recommend going to YouTube and just search tightening Adam's clasps. And you'll find tons of videos on how to do it. It's much easier to watch this with a video and figure out how to do it than for me to explain it. So I, I'd really recommend going to YouTube and they'll talk all about how to tighten these clasps for you. But this is all you need really for these removables is a bird beak like this, flat on round, to be able to adjust your clasps to be able to get them tight, make sure that the appliances are staying in there really well and they're not flopping around. I've been getting this question often and it just popped up on the chat. <clears throat> Maybe you can go back to the slide with the appliance in showing the seven millimeters or so of expansion because yep. the common question I get is with a removable airway health appliance in adults, are you getting true palatal expansion or dental tipping? Any risk of damaging um, the Buccaneers cortical plate? So a couple different questions in there. Damaging the buckle plate, no way. You're turning these so slowly. It's one milli or a quarter millimeter of activation every 10 days. That is so slow that there's no way you could do that. If you put a rapid palatal expander in and tried to and turned it once a day, absolutely yes, an adult you adults you would do that without a doubt. But this slow expansion is the safest way to go, especially with these adults. And I've never seen with a removable appliance that that happens. If they turn, they turn it too fast, the appliance is just not going to fit. It's not, the movement's not going to keep up. So no, there's no way to do this with removables. You're not, and you really do get a good, it's tricky the wording on how you do this. So 
with the removables, you're definitely not splitting the mid palatal suture because again, you're turning it slow. Are you tipping the teeth on the upper? A minor amount on the lower is a lot of uprighting of the posteriors. There's no, no doubt about it. On the upper, what you're getting is remodeling of the upper arch and of the bone. And so it's a way of expanding out and you're, you're grabbing the teeth in all directions. You've got clasp on the buckle, you've got occlusal coverage of the acrylic on the occlusal, and you've got acrylic on the lingual. So there really isn't a way to tip these teeth. You're moving, you're moving the whole upper arch and remodeling the upper arch and the teeth kind of go along for the ride. That's my rudimentary lab guy description. <laughs> I would suggest with those questions to hit up Dr. Moralia. Those are great questions for Dr. Moralia to answer. Absolutely. <laughs> and actually, if you want to refer to our previous conversations, he gives those answers um, in, in our other recorded conversations that you can find on our website as well, uh, where Dr. Moralia will go over the specifics of the expansion in itself. Um, the other question was, which kind of a follow-up is, are you getting um, expansion of the floor of the nose as well? I believe yes, but again, I'm gonna have to defer yeah. to Dr. Moralia's on that, yep. So I've heard Dr. Moralia confirm that yes, you do get um, expansion of the floor of the nose as well. Okay, so I just wanted while we had that slide close and we didn't have to yeah. start searching for it, you thought Absolutely. I'd address some of these questions. Thanks, Kevin. You got it, we're almost done here, so let's... Okay. Uh, finish up here quickly. So lower expander, like we talked about, um, the same way with the lower, you're going to, you can see it as it opens up the two pieces of acrylic, they move out away from each other. You're going to come in here and just measure that distance between the two cuts of acrylic. And that will let you know how much you've, you've expanded it. Again, this is the same size screw, each turns a quarter millimeter. So you want to get out to that about six, seven millimeters of expansion is your about your max with these. And you gotta remember if you're gonna be doing either straight wire or aligners after this, you can pick up a couple extra millimeters with those techniques. So you don't have to get everything with the appliance. You know, the appliances are designed to be bulldozers to get the max amount of movement, big movements. And then you can come in with aligners and with straight wire to kind of finish everything up and get that last little bit that you may need. So. Uh, this is just a way to get big movements for you quickly and uh, pretty efficiently with them as well. Um, one, and I, I'm going to bring this up, especially for people that are new, because it is a question we get fairly often is how to turn these screws for the expanders. And what you'll do is we'll send this key along with the case. You put the key in the hole in the anterior, and there's a little arrow in here, and you can see it. You push that key distally to rotate the screw until it stops. And then you see the hole for the next adjustment is visible in the anterior. That's considered one complete turn. And that's a quarter millimeter of activation. Gets a little confusing. People think when they think of a key and turning it, like you would turn your uh, key to turn or start your car. You're not turning that key, you're using it as a shifter to push that screw and tumble over itself to um, get the expansion that way with it. So um, you know it's a complete turn when the hole for the next adjustment is visible. You pull the key out from the back. You don't uh, push it back and forth. It comes all the way to the back. If for some reason the patient's overexpanded it, you can turn these screws backwards and get it to go back in and fit You know, a couple turns if you need to. So just because they've turned it once doesn't mean you're um, locked into that position, they go both ways. So you can turn it back if you need to. We never want to get you see you guys like this ever. Mm -hmm. If you have questions or you need help, call the lab. Let us know, email us, whatever you need to, but we're here to help you. We really are. Um, myself or Al, Al's been with us for about 25 years as well. He's as good as anybody about this. He's been to Dr. Moralia's classes. He knows what he's doing and he knows the technique as well. So feel free to contact him as well, or Chris, if you have any questions, um, if you're not able to get a hold of me for some reason. But we don't want you to be frustrated. Let us know if you have questions. Our website has some good information on it, um, on all of these different types of appliances. There's also a whole gallery of many different types of expansion appliances. So if you have questions or have seen other ones and we're wondering you know, what else is available and what else is out there, 
We've got plenty of pictures and information on this website. Um, if you want to upload scans to us, you can do that in our 3D portal. There's all kinds of really good information, um, adjustment information on the appliances, um, patient instructions, all kinds of stuff on here. So we will be redoing this here pretty soon, but um, this is a great resource for you. Just ollendorfapplianceLab.com and you can find out all about us and all about the appliances from there. I alluded to YouTube earlier. We've got a great channel um, with tons of videos on all the different appliances that are available from you know, removable, fixed, space maintainers. You know, there's some supplementary information on there, retainers, all kinds of different things. So our YouTube channel is a great resource as well. There is some adjustment videos on there for the different appliances. So you can go there um, for some of that also. Just go to YouTube, type in Ohlendorf Lab and our channel will come up. You can subscribe to it. And that way you'll get a notification when we add new um, videos to it. I haven't been as good about adding stuff as I should be, but um, this is the place to see all the new videos and everything that we're doing and some more great information. Uh, this is our client's hot, hotline. If you have questions during the day, we're in St. Louis, Central Time, Monday through Friday, uh, 7.30 to 4, and you can contact us there. Probably the best way to get a hold of me um, is through email. I, emails, I can answer and get your information back right away as opposed to def, necessarily taking phone calls. Um, sometimes it's tough to get away, especially right now, and I'll explain that to you in a minute, but uh, if you have pictures or you want to send those along with questions, I'll be more than happy to help you out any way that I can. Uh, if you need something immediate and can't get a hold of me, then you can contact Al and he'll, he'll let you know. But I can, emails are probably the best way to get to me at this point, but calls to do work as well. Because we are moving into a brand new laboratory this summer. And hey, so, how exciting. I know, and I'm really excited. <laughs> this is our new building that we're having uh, renovated right now. And so it's taken a lot of my time up. So I apologize if I can't get back to everybody as quickly as I would like to, but this is really um, going to be exciting for us and really open up some new things for us. So we're really excited about that. But with that, that is my presentation and all my tips and tricks. I hope it was helpful for everyone. Well, this is certainly very helpful because you answered like the common questions I get on a daily basis that <laughs> I refer to you. So I'm going to refer now that they watch um, the video and call you directly. Um, you can stop sharing. I do have some uh, questions. I also want to share that I've received a lot of comments of just about how helpful you are from a lot of clients of yours that are watching oh, that, great. you know, they really love your services and your teams and um, you guys are the best. So all those are, are popping up um, in the chat I'm getting. So, and a lot of our doctors are currently wearing appliances as that's we right. speak, <laughs> like exactly. myself. Um, so it, it does work. I think that that's kind of like the big um, question for people who aren't really familiar, especially with adult removable expanders is, does it work and will it cause damage? And there's so many um, testimonials on that and cases that, especially over your 30 years, you've seen that it's really amazing what we can do with the intermittent forces. Absolutely, and we see it on a daily basis. It's, you know, it's amazing. If there was a problem or if there were issues, believe me, I wouldn't be on Facebook telling you that these are fine. <laughs> right. you know I mean? Exactly, <laughs> so exactly. We've been doing them since 1933. We, we can help you with them. Um, I do have a couple of specific questions is, uh, let me just get to the top. Um, do you ever need or use a face bow of both and a bite registration in CR? We do not. So okay. all you need to do is just send us your the bite where you want us. Most of the time with the removable, we just need it to be open about two millimeters um, of thickness. So the occlusal pads can be the proper thickness so they don't break. And that's all that we need for it. Just to buy any type of construction bite of any material. And um, a Dr. Yin wants to ask about the removable appliance. You have um, screw to lateral expansion but I realize there is a labial um, bow. Will it be limiting the expansion on the anterior region with the labial bow? You do need to, move, to adjust the labial bow as you go along. So as the appliance opens up, that labial bow flattens out and pulls back against the anteriors. So you just go in again with that flat on round and open up those loops a little bit at each time that you see the patient, and that'll move that labial bow out away from the teeth. 
And you'll know you need to do that because the patient will say, hey, this wire is rubbing on my teeth now. And when they say that, just go in and open up those loops and you're good to go. Great. Um, is it too quick to turn adult expanders weekly? If you want, I can chime in from Dr. Mariah. <laughs> that, I know, I hate to keep saying that, but I, that's, he has his specific preference on how the speed that he likes to turn them. I think it's, and I do suggest this for some, start with once a week if you want to. If it starts to be a problem, you can always back them off to 10, to, you know, every 10 days. Uh, but again, I know Dr. Morelia is pretty specific. Um, yeah, you know. actually, he started me out every two weeks just to get used to it for a little bit, which was yeah. helpful. And um, the more compliant you are, and if I like using the Propel, actually, the VPro5 is helpful, I find, to do the weekly uh, when I'm compliant. If I'm not, you know, as compliant as I can be, certainly I, I won't be doing the weekly turn. You really can't. It won't fit. You know, exactly. it's almost like you don't have a choice. You don't, it's right. not your decision to make. It just won't fit. If exactly. You are compliant. So if you're turning the screws faster than the, than the arch is remodeling, you're right. It, that's what's going to happen. It's not going to fit anymore. And then in that case, you got to go back, turn the screws backwards, get it back to where it'll fit and then restart kind of. So you're right. Um, what are your recommendations for keeping the um, appliances clean? Really, all you want to do is just brush them. So just okay. brush them every day. Um, when you brush your teeth, you should take your appliance out, brush them with just regular toothpaste. Uh, you can use some denture cleaners, you know, if you want to soak them a little bit, but you don't need anything real specific or harsh with them. You know, there's nothing. And I know there's some other products out there that you can get um, that disinfect them a little bit that seem to work fine too, but we just always recommend just brushing them with toothpaste. Right. And um, you, how is that all you're doing with them? Yeah, that's all I'm doing. I like yeah. my um, my electric toothbrush that I use yeah. and get in there the nooks and crannies. And I, I really don't need more than that. Right. But I do it quite often, you know, because yeah. um, I'm working from home. So that's helpful. Sure, and sure. Uh, also, I just like to keep like a hand sanitizer on my case. That's one of my tips and tricks, like a key ring with a hand sanitizer, especially now these um, COVID era, just to help, you know, take it in and out. It's a little bit more hygienic that way to sure. have the hand sanitizer on your case. Yeah. So on Amazon, they have like the key rings with the little bottles of hand sanitizer. Mm -hmm. I find that to right. be very helpful. Yeah. Um, um, are any of these appliances billable towards OSA treatment? Uh, that I do not know. I don't okay. believe so though, because these are more active orthodontic appliances and I don't think you can bill those for those, but I, I don't know that. And how many hours a day should an adult wear a removable appliance? I know there's a lot of... Um, different recommendations. Mm -hmm. I think, you know, you definitely want to have them wear it throughout the night. And then, you know, maybe an hour on, hour off, you know, every, you know, or two hours off, something in that range is, is pretty good. It's not as important. I, I, this is a good question because mm -hmm. there's a lot of different philosophies on this. Yeah. When I first started at the lab, it was 24 seven, you wear those. Oh, wow. Yeah, eat wow. with them, everything. Mm -hmm. If you want them to work 24 seven. And then that's kind of changed over time. It's kind of gotten relaxed a little bit, but I, you'll, you'll know, the patient will know if they're wearing them by how they fit. Yeah. So if, if they're not fitting as well and they're having some pain and issues, they're not wearing it enough. So they need to bump up the time. If they're wearing it, take, take it in and out throughout the day, no problems at all, then they're good to go. I know that's a kind of a vague, you know, but everybody's going to be different. Some people are going to adapt faster to them than others. So it's just going to kind of be a trial and error thing. Yeah, More and it's better. really, the um, intermittent forces, uh, Dr. Morales says, are just as important to have it out as it is in. Mm -hmm. Like to wear it, you know, 22 hours a day is not a good thing. So um, right. I actually found it very helpful. I was in clear aligners prior to the expander. And I found it it's easier for compliance for me because I like the break throughout the day rather than wearing it um, you know, all the time with the aligners. Sure. Um, do you recommend any um, oral appliance options for children with lower cognitive levels and those with special needs, as well as typical developing children ages one to four? Ooh, mm -hmm. I, at that early age, not really. Yeah. Yeah, and, it's just too young for them. One, and, from a practical part of it, most of the first molars haven't erupted. So what we've found in, pay, in doctors that have started that early is they may expand out 
the arch, the D's and E's, but the first molars are up to the lingual and then they're gonna come in with the second expander and push the molars out to where they need to be because the appliance won't affect those, uh, those teeth. So um, it, I'd do really best to wait until those first molars are up before you start any appliances. Great, and um, I'm trying to, I think you got so many of these questions done in your tips that it's very Good. effective, <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, any appliance that can solve both posterior and anterior crossbites? So we didn't get into that. I just went with the expanders, but there mm -hmm. is a three-way expander that will allow you to do that, that you can widen and push forward. That'll be for our next tips and tricks. How about that? Okay, thanks. You have me back. Well, you have me gotcha. Back. I love the suspense. You know, I'm <laughs> right. sure this is something. I can't believe it's been half a year since we first started this. I know, you know it's, it's amazing. It's time, yeah. goes, time goes fast. Um, let me just see if there's one more that I can get here to close out. Um, what is the most common appliance used? Fine. On the on for removable, it's the the, the removable Schwartz expander, mm -hmm. um, and then on the upper for expansion, it's a rapid palatal expander RPE type of thing. Okay. Yeah. All right. Well, this was very helpful. I have three minutes left, so I'm just going to go ahead and um, share my screen for some updates here. So let me just go ahead and do that. Um, if anyone wants to learn Dr. Moralia's specific techniques, we developed a two-day mini residency just on that. So this is a technique-driven course. Um, we actually have two spots open for Friday's adult mini residency, and we do have them monthly with the exception of August and um, December. So if you're interested in learning more, please uh, contact me or you can go to our website, airwayhealthsolutions.com. We are excited because we're launching our first clear aligner case review. That is actually tomorrow night. We don't have any spots left for case submitters, um, but we do have plenty of spots left for auditors. So if you're interested in, it's more like a workshop where Dr. Moralia is going to just be reviewing um, clear aligner cases. In this case, we're going to be reviewing Invisalign um, case over and over. Please consider joining us and visiting the website for more information. There's plenty of room for June 3rd if you want to be a case submitter and have your case reviewed. Um, I highly recommend that you uh, follow us on social media because we'll keep you updated with new information, new tips and tricks. Uh, follow my blog. It actually goes through my expansion journey. And Kevin, you even noticed how wider I am now, right? Look at that picture, just, right? That's a you great know, testimony. It's really right? kind of, I, I just have to keep smiling because I can see my molars. I can... You know, I went from 29 millimeters, I'm at 33 millimeters now. So go ahead and um, follow the blog. It's videos as well as um, written blogs. But I find that patients are really enjoying this. So a lot of our clients are telling me that they find it um, incredibly helpful to see the journey and to have me go through it, have me speak with them to see what it sounds like and just my journey and the progress and some of the pitfalls that I had as well. So I keep it real and I keep it patient friendly on purpose. So that's um, a tool for you to utilize. We have um, great upcoming Airway Health Solutions conversations. You can always register um, here at airwayhealthsolutions.com forward slash register. But we have Dr. Michael Gelb coming on April 7th, um, Dr. Stacy um, Ochoa, Dr. Ben's going to come back, uh, Dr. Professor, uh, excuse me, Professor John Yu. This is a Friday at noon, but it will be recorded. So I'm really looking forward to that as well as all of these. But, and Dr. Lauren Ballinger is a pediatric dentist who only does airway all day, every day. She's strictly uh, an airway practice now. So stay tuned for that. I did want to give you this code because it's still valid. We had Dr. Carstensen on a previous um, segment and there is a code to get 15% off the new ADA brochure, which I always find helpful when speaking with parents. It's always nice to have the ADA seal. And you may want to mention that they bring this to their pediatrician so you can kind of educate the medical community as well that they can see what the American Dental Association is now recommending. We have um, airway dentists now all over the country and in Canada. Uh, we don't have a Canadian map yet. I'm working on that. But we are so thrilled that people who are trained by us, we actually have a locator. It's airwayhealthsolutions.com forward slash locator 
where patients are looking for airway dentists and I send them to these dots daily. So if you're interested in getting new patients uh, and becoming an Airway Health Solutions airway dentist, you can take our mini residency and then you too will be a green dot. We need some in this area here. So if anyone's in the Dakotas, Wyoming, you know, we need to kind of fill this out a little bit more. I was thinking um, more, more about Hawaii. I think I, yeah, there's, there's one. There's Hawaii. one there. Right. <laughs> we <laughs> have, um, yep, yep, we have one. And we actually have a client in Mongolia. Oh, wow. Uh, yeah, and in Trinidad. So oh, wow. we, are, we are worldly, I should say. Um, <laughs> here's our contact information. But a couple of questions were, can we get the slides of this? And we certainly can give um, a PDF version of the tips and tricks. Uh, and then for our Airway Health Solutions clients, I'm sure I will give you the prescription form to help you um, communicate a little bit easier with the lab. So stay tuned for that in the follow-up email. And I'm going to go ahead and stop my share and see if there are any more questions that came in because we're at 901 and we're very timely. Hmm. Okay, I think we're good. We just got a lot of thank yous, Kevin. So um, really, this was great, down to earth and very helpful, very great. practical and um, always enjoyable to speak with you. Definitely, I appreciate the opportunity. It's been great. Like you and said, I can't believe it's been six or seven months since we did the first one. It's And thousands of, of people. That's right. right. Exactly. <laughs> That's what I love. Okay. For sure. um, thank you everyone for joining us. Uh, we will send you the follow-up with the recording as well as um, a handout. So thank you all. Have a great night. We'll see you next time. Thanks. Take care. Thanks, Ken.